hearing his word so that we can be moved to action. And Jesus chastises this crowd for their inability to recognize God's real presence in their midst and to be moved to act and to be converted in their lives. The long-awaited Messiah was right there before their eyes, yet they could not see him. They could not recognize him. If they understood who was in their midst, if they recognized God's presence, real and present to them in the flesh, they would have been compelled to take a deeper look at their own lives and to recognize their own need for spiritual renewal. Jesus gives us the same message today. Today we encounter the risen Christ, the same Christ, but present to us in the Word, in the Eucharist, but also in our hearts. He understands our human nature. He allows us to hear him in his word, to see him in the blessed sacrament, to even touch him, to receive him bodily. But do we always adequately discern his ever presence beyond what we see, hear, touch, taste? How often do we recognize Jesus' presence <coughs> in our hearts? Do we recognize that he came to dwell in us? <coughs> and he tells us this in our baptism. Baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that the Trinity dwells within us. He lets us know that he is always lovingly probing the depth of our hearts, pricking our consciences, inviting us to respond daily to converting our lives to conversion and to work towards reaching our proper end, life of God in heaven. This is why St. Paul was so moved to give thanks to God. He says, For I take the light and the law of God in my inner self, but at the same time, I see in my members another principle at war with the law of my mind. Now, we know that St. Thomas teaches us that evil is an absence of being, all you philosophy majors. <laughs> so, St. Paul is rejoicing that the lack that is within him, that evil within him, filled by a true being, an actual living being dwelling within him. Despite his human weakness, he realized that the resurrected Lord was truly present in his life, healing and nurturing him. The saint that we honor today, Saint John Capistrano, he even teaches us the importance of recognizing Jesus' presence in our lives and in our hearts. Brother Joe gave us some uh, insight about um, St. John. As you know, and many of you probably know, he was born in 1386 in Capistrano, Abruzzo, in Italy. He was a lawyer, as was, he's the patron of lawyers and someone else. I know, uh, you said uh, he's a patron of uh, John Church. Jurors, right? Thank you. So he had his conversion experience probably very similar to Francis. He ended up being imprisoned during a war, a time of war between two cities, Perugia and Malatestas. But shortly while he was in prison, he joined the Franciscans and he studied under the tutelage of Saint Bernardine. He took a strict approach to the Franciscan life, and he even became a spokesman for the observant movement. He was a famous preacher. In fact, he could draw thousands and thousands of people willing to listen to the Lord's message coming through him and changing their hearts, converting and moving people to love Christ. I encourage you to read his biography, but what I wanted to do point out his powerful word, powerful words that come out of his preaching. 
Some of you probably already read the office, but I want to touch on a few things in the office that he says. And these things are, are, are basically a, spoken to those who are responsible for the souls that they care for, the presbyters, and those in consecrated life. He says that the brightness of their wisdom must make them like the light of the world that brings light to others. They must learn from the eminent teacher, Jesus Christ, what he declared not only to the apostles and disciples, but also to all the priests and clerics who were to succeed them when he said, you are the salt of the earth. His point is that our interior life will affect our exterior life. The people we encounter will know it. They know if we're real or not, amen? amen. <coughs> it gets even down, dirt, down and dirty. He says, truly, the unclean and moral cleric is trampled underfoot like worthless manure. Now, I thought manure was good. I thought manure was useful. Maybe they didn't understand uh, horticulture at this time. But it goes further and says, <laughs> that cleric is saturated with the filth and vice and entangled in the chains of sin. In this condition, he must be considered worthless both to himself and to others. He goes further to say that this is a challenge. It's a challenge being a priest or a lay cleric or a lay religious. It takes work interiorly and exteriorly. We all know this just by our experience here in formation. The challenge of keeping up with studies and balancing that with our prayer life. The challenge of, of relating with our brothers, those we seem to get along with easily and those we barely ever talk to. He says, it is indeed a double task that worthy priests perform, that is to say, it is both exterior and interior, both temporal and spiritual, and finally, both a passing task and an eternal one. But then he gives us hope. He gives us the hope. He says, even though they dwell on earth and we are bound by the same necessities of nature, along with all mortal creatures, at the same time, they are engaged in earnest communication with the angels in heaven, so that they may be pleasing to their king and learn how to serve him. What a wonderful consolation to know that we have God's love through his angels, through the saints, and all those heavenly beings who care for us and know the weaknesses that we struggle through as human beings. Brothers and sisters, what we hear today are words of encouragement to realize that Jesus is ever present to us and desires more than we do. That we live our humanity 